Testing. Testing. Commissioner Coots, we're recording and ready to go. Great, thank you. Good evening, uh, welcome. This is the Planning Commission business meeting for the city of Cottonwood Heights for this Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. For those of you that are joining us there, uh, we have one item on our agenda this evening, uh, which, which we'll, I'll just run through quickly and then, I'll, then we'll run through how we run these meetings just so you know when it's appropriate uh, and how, how we'll work through these items. Um, we start with this um, and I would invite any of the commissioners if they have any, any commu communications or conflicts of interest to disclose on our, our business meeting agenda, this would be the time to do it. Hearing none. Um, then what we'll do is move into a general public comment period. This is a time for you to um, share with us your comments or concerns uh, about anything that's happening in the city outside of the item that's on our agenda tonight. That will have its own public comment period. So if you um, are attending or would like to comment on the item that's on our agenda, we'll, do, we'll open a public comment period just for that item. The general public comment period is for other items um, and you're welcome to come to the podium, state your name and um, have three minutes to share what you'd like to share. And then we will uh, then go into our, our, our agenda item this evening, which is project CUP 21015. This will be a public hearing to receive comments and take possible action on a request from Mark Maybe, Canyon Center Residential LLC for a conditional use permit to update the Canyon Center multifamily building, which is to be located at 7358 Can Canyon Center Parkway. This was previously, previously approved by the Planning Commission in 2015 as a part of the uh, Canyon Center project, which many of you are aware of. If you're not, it's the one right just south of the 7-Eleven at Fort Union and Wasatch Boulevard with the new hotel and Eight Settlers Restaurant and Sayola and the canyon, uh, there's condos that have been there for a long time, in addition to the new single family housing that's in there. So that's, that is our project there. And we'll go through um, and have the city present the project. We'll have the uh, representative from the developer present the pro their request tonight and then have uh, public comments. And then the planning commission will have a chance to deliberate and uh, decide how to move forward on that. And then after that, we have some consent agenda items, which are planning commission minutes. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and open the general public comment period. Again, this is for anyone who's here to share uh, general public comments with the city. You're welcome to go ahead and approach the podium or raise your hand if you are participating online um, and we will give you three minutes. Just make sure you state your name. My goodness, start. I uh, just want to say. 
Okay, cool. Uh, my name's Jack Allred. I live uh, on Racket Club Drive in McIntosh Lane near the parcel. And I believe I sent a letter that hopefully the planning commission was interested about my concerns with the proposed change. Is this, is this about the apartment project? Yeah. Okay, so that's the next one. This is just general comments, not associated oh, with the agenda. Well then. So hold, will, hold on 10 I minutes. I will come back in a minute. Thank you. Yeah. We'll let you know, Jack. Thank you. Commissioner Coots, you're muted, but I don't see any additional uh, public comments here. You knew what I was saying. Um, thank you. And we will go ahead and close the general public comment period for tonight and move on to our business meeting agenda item, which is the project CUP-21-015, uh, the Canyon Center residential request for conditional use for a change in the number of units. I'll go ahead and turn it over to the city representative to present the request. Is that, yeah, okay, we're good. Okay, thank you, commission. Uh, we, we did go through this in the work session, but I will go through it again uh, in detail for the benefit of those attending the business meeting. So this is request CUP 21015. Um, I think most people are familiar with the location of this project. It's the multifamily um, parcel uh, in Canyon Center, in the Canyon Center project. The request is to amend uh, the previous conditional use permit approved for this project, CUP 14009, uh, with a proposal to add more units to the, the previously approved building. Uh, in 2015, this, this phase of the Canyon Center project was approved and entitled for up to 112 units. Uh, the proposed increase is, is 140 total units, so 28 additional units. 16 of those units are, are gained without modifying the building footprint at all. Um, just by by dividing uh, primarily by dividing two story units previously into uh, one story units now. Um, I, I have a unit count analysis later on in this presentation. Uh, but but over half of the proposed additional units are are within the existing footprint just by the way the interior of the building was designed. Uh, Twelve of the units gained um, are, are done so with a minor building expansion uh and a modification to the site plan that was approved by the architecture review commission in april of 2020. Uh, so for a little bit of background uh some context here this is the the overall canyon center project um, the original approval of phase two which which included the apartment building we're talking about tonight it also included the adjacent uh, single family 17 home development and it included the restaurant that is now eight settlers. That entitlement and conditional use approval was granted back in 2015. Prior to that, approval was granted for the office building and the parking structure. Uh, and after that, uh, the, the couple of years after that, approval was granted uh, in one instance to the standalone restaurant that is Sayola, and later to the hotel. And then um, just a couple of years ago to two small retail pads. So. As an entire project, the Canyon Center 11 acre project is fully entitled with conditional use uh, approval, uh, which typically would mean all, all the buildings in there are, are ready for building permit, the building permit and construction phase of the project, or as you can see out there today, they're already built. Uh, the, the reason this is back, like I said, is because of the uh, additional units requested. And the approval of the, of the uh, original phase two specifically said this, this letter approves a maximum of 112 units. So again, for background, in 2015, this was the, uh, the proposed uh, massing and architecture of the building. Just a year later, that was amended and approved by the city again uh, to, to update the architecture to uh, different material and design. This did not impact the footprint or the building height. Um, so the building height and footprint established in phase, original phase two uh, remained the same uh, with the updated architecture. And again, this is a, a site plan. 
And then in April 2020, the, uh, the developer submitted an application uh, for site plan modification, uh, which runs through the city's architectural review commission through, through public meetings, but not public hearings. They, um, because no, no change in the use was proposed, it was just a site plan amendment. The architecture commission is that authority. Obviously the unit counts are in front of the commission tonight because that is the commission's authority. Uh, but uh, expansions in two areas of the building were approved in 2020. Uh, one to the courtyard area, the, the majority of the impact makes the courtyard access a little bit narrower and extends into the courtyard slightly. The second area that was modified is the northwest corner. Uh, the massing uh, was extended slightly there to accommodate uh, potential for additional units that we're considering now. So just a, a quick before and after there uh, to show the changes. Um, nothing else uh, was proposed to, to be modified from the previously approved site plan. And again, showing that the top was, was before and the bottom is the, the current approval, uh, which is, is not up for discussion or debate tonight. It's already been approved, but just some context. So I also want to clarify that the scope, uh, the commission's scope for this uh, conditional use application. Like I said, this is an amendment to the previous conditional use approval. Back in 2015, there was a site, uh, a, a site proposal that included buildings and, and massing and density and building heights and, and uses and unit counts for all of the different phases of the project. That was approved. Uh, that also included a traffic study at the time that, again, at the time was accepted and approved by the city for the site. Um, modifying those terms and the terms of that approval is, is not within the commission's scope tonight. Uh, so the commission's uh, authority and scope on this application is limited to the impact of the additional 28 units on the Canyon Center project. Uh, this, this comes right out of state code and gives some context for, uh, for every city in, in the state when we consider conditional use applications, um, the, the restrictions that, that we're allowed to impose and, and things we're not allowed uh, to impose as a city. So I'm not going to read the, the full thing here, but this is verbatim out of the state code. Uh, and I will read the top paragraph here. Um, and it states a land use authority, which in this case is the Planning Commission, shall approve a conditional use if reasonable conditions are proposed or can be imposed to mitigate the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects of the proposed use in accordance with applicable standards. What that means is even though this is a conditional use request, it is entitled to approval. Uh, the commission's authority is to look at the impact of the request, again, 28 additional units, determine if there are any potential negative impacts created by those additional units in this case, um, impose conditions, reasonable conditions that will mitigate those impacts um, and, and, then, and then make a decision. Only if there, it's determined that there are no reasonable impacts that can be imposed to mitigate a, a condition, uh, can a land use authority deny a conditional use permit? And I will say, and I, I think the city attorney can back me up, that's extremely rare anywhere in Utah uh, for a land use authority to, to meet the criteria to fully deny a conditional use permit. Uh, so impact analysis, uh, analyzing the, the impact, this is staff's analysis, of the impact of the additional units on the overall Canyon Center project. When this was approved in 2015, Canyon Center was one singular project. Subsequently, it was subdivided for ownership purposes, but it was one project. So density calculations um, have always been calculated based on the full project area, which is a, roughly 11 acres. Um, the permitted density in the mixed use zone today is 35 units per acre. Um, the existing project density with 112 units plus the 17 single family homes that have already been approved is 12 units per acre, roughly. The proposed project density, uh, so increasing those units by 28 plus the 17 single family homes is only 14 units per acre. So from a pure density analysis, this is still well under what's permitted by city code. Building height and massing, the, the site plan modification was previously approved by the Architecture Commission. And no building height increase is proposed with this. Uh, it's still subject to the maximum building height standards and, and requirements that were uh, established back in 2015. Uh, unit counts. Uh, originally uh, in, in 2015, uh, and these are, these are uh, 
I think accurate approximations, but may not be exact down to the precise unit count. But um, the, the original approval was a mix of one and two bedroom units. Uh, I went through and checked these again today. There were no three bedroom units proposed originally. Uh, the, the mix of one to two bedroom units, it was about 60% one bedroom to 40% two bedroom, which is, is roughly 65 to 45. Uh, the current proposal is also a mix of one and two bedroom units. Again, still no three bedroom units. Uh, and that mix is about 70, 30 uh, in favor of one bedroom units, uh, about 90, mid nineties in, in single and in, in one, one bedroom and, and 45 or so in two bedroom. A lot of the units were gained, like I said, the original proposal had uh, two story units that are no longer proposed uh, as extensively as they were. And by splitting up previous two story units into one, one story units on multiple floors, um, that, that allows them to, to get a lot of the additional requested units within the existing footprint. Parking, uh, for parking for any development project in the city, and, and this was true of all the other Canyon Center phases and, and developments elsewhere in the city. Uh, our ordinance requires that the city use the Institute of Traffic Engineers parking generation manual. Uh, doing that for this use, uh, we, we classify this apartment building as a mid-rise apartment, which is any multifamily building less than five stories. Uh, in, in the 2015 approval, per the project staff report, uh, 180 total stalls were, were provided uh, for 112 maximum units. So the parking ratio there was 1.61 stalls per unit. Um, per the applicant's proposal uh, in front of you tonight, uh, 249 stalls are proposed to be provided to serve 140 maximum units. So that, that parking ratio jumps up to 1.78 stalls per unit. Um, so, so the ratio is, is higher than it was in 2015 and, and both were well above the, the absolute minimum. Get traffic, and I know there's a lot of concern on traffic, so um, I'll do my best to be thorough here. Um, Project-wide traffic study was previously submitted um, numerous times, but last updated in 2016 based on the following site development, which is a hotel, a office, restaurant, retail, 113 apartments and single family homes. And, and I think it's important to state here, the city previously approved all phases of development under the conditions anticipated in those previous traffic studies. So, so those have been approved. Uh, staff requested with this proposal that the applicant update the traffic study to account for the additional 28 units, uh, but also to provide updated traffic data to reflect current conditions on site. Uh, the, the traffic study came in just this afternoon and I will publish that on the city website right after this meeting. Um, so, so it's available publicly, um, but uh, what it found is the 28 additional units generates uh, an additional 146 vehicle trips per day beyond what was previously anticipated of the 113 units. Um, at a peak hour demand, which was uh, explained in the traffic study to be in the evening, uh, generally between five and six, uh, the, the peak hour demand was for the whole 140 units was 62 trips. That's 11 more than was previously anticipated before this request came in. So when it was 113 units being analyzed, the, the peak hour demand was 51, it's now 62. The traffic study conclusion is at the peak hour, the 11 additional trips uh, will add no more than two additional cars to any single traffic movement. Uh, in the new traffic memo, uh, it states that new traffic counts were taken uh, last week uh, at that evening peak hour. Uh, and, and per uh, Utah Department of Transportation data, uh, it was determined that October is generally uh, about 80, 81% of the, um, the average, of the, the highest average uh, traffic generation. So, so essentially October, is not the peak month for traffic generation. Um, so to account for that, uh, the study states that um, the traffic volumes counted last week were adjusted up 19% to account for average turning movements uh, year round at, at the maximum uh, you know, average demand and adjusted up another, um, uh, another uh, increment, so to 22.8% to account for winter peak hour conditions at intersections. 
Now, this does not include when snow covers roadway stripes and lanes and cars are, are parked poorly. That's, those are concerns, but that's not always captured in, in, uh, in these traffic studies. Level of service here refers to uh, average wait time at any intersection to make a turn movement. Uh, the analysis um, also provided uh, a, a, an, just a review of what would happen if there was a modification made to the Canyon Center Parkway Wasatch Boulevard intersection uh, to, to restrict northbound turns on the Wasatch from Canyon Center Parkway. So that's a left turn enter, exiting the project area and turning on the Wasatch headed north. And, and I'll talk more about that in a minute of why we asked the applicant to review that and, and where staff feels it falls within the scope of, of the commission's authority. Um, like I said, this report was received just this afternoon and sent right away to the to planning commission. It will be posted online later. Um, given that I am a, a planner by trade and not an engineer, I had the city engineer look at this and, and give me feedback uh, from an engineering perspective. Uh, the, their conclusion was the methodology used in the traffic update memo is, is legitimate. It's, it's standard practice for how traffic studies are done. Uh, the additional 28 units, um, the engineer concurred that it does not create any additional undue burden beyond what was previously identified that would require additional mitigation. Now we're looking only at the additional units and their impact, um, but that doesn't invalidate the concerns that already exist or the concerns with previous traffic studies, um, that concerns that even staff shares, but, but the scope tonight is the additional 28 units. Um, the city engineer also agreed that the city should absolutely support the, the restricted movement at uh, the intersection of Canyon Center Parkway and Wasatch Boulevard because of the impact it has to that level of service, which again, I'll talk about in just a second. And also for context, um, the, the, this project area and the, the project road system is on the, the city's plan, the city's uh, five-year road improvement plan uh, to be uh, a slurry seal, which is a, a an updated treatment on the road uh, to, to extend the life of the road uh, and a restriping is scheduled for next summer. Um, so, th so that also applies to some of the impacts I'll talk about in, in my next slide. Um, that being said, so traffic studies are, they're a common tool that are used to anticipate the impact of traffic when a development doesn't yet fully exist. But we understand, and we understand that there are limitations to them. They, they make, assumptions, they make educated assumptions and, and, and you know, it's engineers putting their credentials on the line to make these assumptions and use methodology that's accepted in the state of Utah. Um, but they make assumptions about uh, where traffic will go and, and what the impact of traffic will be on a development and on the surrounding area. Um, before anything's built, that's the best, uh, that one of the best tools we have available to assess uh, the impact of development. That being said, this is now a city road system and, and the city is, is absolutely um, concerned and obligated to continue to monitor this throughout development. It's, it's now about half built out the project. Um, so, so we'll see more um, you know, real world data of how traffic behaves, especially when the parking structure is being used uh, in the winter and ski season comes. And we'll be able to continue to monitor the, the, um, you know, what's going on in this project area to supplement what's anticipated in the traffic study. Um, and at that point, then it's a city obligation to correct any, uh, any concerns or, or deficiencies in the roadway system. So that leads me to this, this last slide, which is um, Canyon Center concerns that we've heard um, not only with public comments and discussions staff has had leading to this meeting, but also even prior to this with residents in the nearby area. Um, that again, staff's opinion that these, uh, many of these concerns are not directly attributable to the, the extra 28 units. Um, I will, for context, the, the city engineer and I looked at the old traffic studies done and there were conditions identified in there that uh, frankly, we, we found some concerns with that if that were in front of us today, we may, we may ask for additional mitigations of the developer. Um, that being said, that was approved and it's entitled and, and we can't put that now, a previously identified concern on, on 28 additional units if it's not creating uh, a tangible impact to the condition identified previously. However, um, that doesn't mean that the city's gonna ignore the concerns raised and, and I'll just share some, some 
uh, ideas and, and an approach that we have, uh, at least preliminarily, to address some of the concerns that were heard. And we understand it's not going to address all the concerns and all the, the questions. Uh, one is roadway striping. Uh, a year or two ago, we asked the, the Canyon Center developer to restripe the roadway. There was previously a middle lane running down the entire road. Uh, that wasn't really warranted. Um, we don't really need the middle turn lane um, in a, a small road network like this. Uh, so, so rather than have that middle turn lane there, we asked them to restripe that. And that resulted in um, two lanes on the, the north and east side of the roadway, plus a shoulder that accommodates um, um, parking, on-street parking on the south and west side of the property. Uh, additionally, there was a, a bike lane striped on the north and east side and a red curb that prohibits any on-street parking. Uh, this was in an effort to, uh, to improve traffic flow through the area. Um, we had instances where um, vehicles were still parked on the shoulder and they were halfway in the lane of traffic. Um, and we have this single family neighborhood in here that um, has very limited overflow parking and that all have their own trash and recycling receptacles. And it created a, a real concern and issue, um, especially on uh, garbage pickup day. So, so we feel that the steps taken have, have are in the right direction. They've helped um, create a, a space where there can be parking, uh, where trash receptacles can be placed on garbage day. Um, we've also spoken with these residents. The city does offer a permit parking program, which would restrict parking in front of this project to only residents within the project that have parking permits. Um, and, and there would be signs put up. That's a city council process. And we're happy to move that forward and have communicated that with the residents there. We have existing on-street parking um, conditions in, in a few different areas. One is the you know, Porcupine Alpha Coffee and, and other parking on Racket Club Drive, uh, which is outside this project and existed before this project, but um, you know, something the city's monitoring and, and has made small tweaks to a few times to, to try to help address issues that have been raised. And we'll continue to look at that. And then again, like I just said, on-street parking for residents and, and overflow parking for the single family neighborhood. Um, and again, there's a, a petition process that would restrict some parking uh, specifically for them and their guests. Uh, the other point I want to bring up is the intersections, uh, specifically the intersection of Canyon Center Parkway and Racket Club and Canyon Center Parkway and Wasatch Boulevard. In the original traffic study for the project, uh, these all the intersections were studied and, and assigned levels of service, which again is the wait time at intersections. Generally, uh, a level of service A, B, C, or D is acceptable. Uh, that's at the state level and at the local level uh, across uh, the state. Um, the intersection of Racket Club and Fort Union, as well as the project and Racket Club, were, were both, um, I think, B, a B and a C. However, this intersection on the southeast corner, Canyon Center Parkway and Wasatch, was identified as level of service F. Like I said, normally we would require mitigation to address that as part of the uh, entitlement process, and, and that was not done. And I can't speak to why, and I don't know. Uh, but that is, that is an outstanding concern, and that's one that remains, which is why we asked um, the, the developer to, to analyze that. What would happen if the left turn from Canyon Center Parkway onto Wasatch Boulevard was restricted? And the result is that changes the level of service from an F to a C. So it substantially improves uh, the wait time at that intersection and clearly defines that the, the problematic turn motion there is turning left downhill on Wasatch Boulevard when visibility is pretty limited with cars um, flying down the road, which is why the city's supportive of it. it. It's not an issue that's caused by the 28 units as it was identified as a, a failing intersection back in 2014. However, the developer has conveyed to me, and, and, and I'm sure he can come up and talk about it next, that he's willing to, to fund that improvement and that restriction there um, to eliminate that left turn lane. Uh, the city engineer uh, and I agree that, that we're in favor of that. That helps the, the traffic flow. The traffic uh, memo also analyzed what, what will happen to those cars that would normally be turning left there because they will go somewhere else now. And it doesn't put any of the other turn movements uh, into E or F territory. Uh, the, the last thing I'll touch on, and then I'm, I'll open it up for questions of the commission, 
Uh, there, right now, there's there's a right turn lane and a left turn lane out, out of Canyon Center Parkway onto Racket Club Drive. And that's a little abnormal and, and probably unnecessary. So part of the city's um, slurry coat and, and restriping, we would look at that intersection and make that correction. In addition to, um, you know, restriping the, the roadway itself to be consistent and exactly up to city specs for how we want that roadway striped. So, so I do want to, to clarify just one more time. Um, while we did have concerns with the previous traffic study, they were approved um, and, and entitled as part of the project. Um, the 28 units do not quantifiably make any of those impacts um, tangibly worse than, than they were already anticipated to be. So these concerns that, that I was just talking about are, are city obligations, frankly, at this point. However, the, the developers express willingness to, um, to fund that, the one improvement there that will help the system. So given this data, um, and again, this will all be posted online uh, after the meeting, um, and, and given our limited authority as a land use authority by the state of Utah, uh, looking at the impact of the additional 28 units and, and not identifying uh, any additional impacts that, that we feel cannot be mitigated or, or, or aren't mitigated, um, staff feels uh, that it's appropriate to recommend uh, approval of uh, this request. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate the presentation and the staff recommendation. We'll go ahead and invite a representative from the development team to present their, their request here for conditional use. Thank you and good evening. My name is Mark Maybe I'm the owner and developer of Canyon Center Residential. And I appreciate Mike and his thoroughness in the presentation. We've tried to be very complete because we're very concerned about traffic. That's a main issue for us. We wanted to make sure we could handle traffic. The other issue for us was parking. That's why we've gone to great extent to park the steel correctly. I've been in the development business for 40 years and I've owned thousands of units and I've seen the problem that parking uh, creates at 1.25 on the ratios. Any deal I've ever built or ever owned, I always try to increase it up to almost two per unit because everyone's got two cars and then street parking becomes an issue. So that's been a big issue for me to address. Uh, the quality of this project that was approved by the architectural committee has gone up dramatically. Um, the finishes are up dramatically. We tried not to increase the footprint um, that would create any undue burden upon the community that would affect the community. We've kept the height the same. And like Mike said, uh, 16 of these units are just reconfiguration. Three bedroom units do not do well in the marketplace. And I also wanted to make mention that these units, um, and Mike's got floor plans, they're large one bedroom units and most of them are one bedroom units with the den. So they're very liv livable units. The other issue I've been very careful of over my career is turnover in apartments is a major issue. And how you address turnover is by the quality of your community. And so we've tried to make that very uh, much a, a, a major issue in the design and the development of this project. So these units, most one bedroom units in the marketplace hit about 640. These are 850 and larger. These are very large units. Um, Mike, you've got copies of all those floor plans, don't you? Yeah, so if, you, if anyone wanted to look at the floor plans, they would be a part of this package. So the units are large and large units, livable units make a community more stable because we're very concerned about turnover and making this more of a home than just a temporary residence. Uh, once again, I appreciate the opportunity to work with the city and I could uh, answer any questions that any of the commissioners might have that I could address and answer tonight. Thank you, Mark. Uh, commissioners, while we have him up here, um, do you have any questions or, or we can hold those off until we open for our discussion after the public comment. It's up to you if you have a pressing question, Mark's at the, at the podium. I had a quick one. I actually had this thought in the work session, but it wasn't on the slide. But since you proffered it, I, I, I want to ask you. <laughs> um, we have the analysis in terms of the breakdown between the one and two bedroom. You have the analysis of before and the after in terms of what's being proposed. 
on the breakdown of the square footage is? Is it you're you're changing the percentage of the one and two bedroom right. offerings? Right. Do you have the average square foot that's that the the change in the percentage? Yeah, the Mike's thing? got copies of all those in the in the. But you don't you don't know what that is offhand. They're they're all they vary uh, in the building corner units, um, middle units. The way the building lays out, they vary. But most of the ones vary from anywhere eight twenty, but some of the ones get almost up to nine fifty to nine eighty. Um, I think half of the 70% of the ones are really two bedroom units because they're one bedroom with a den. So in a lot of markets, that would be considered a two bedroom unit, but I were considering a one bedroom with a den. And with what's happened with the pandemic, so many people are working from home. And also in the community, we have recreation rooms, we have business offices, we've uh, accommodated all those features as well, athletic facilities, electric car parking downstairs. I mean, this is a quality, quality community. Did I answer your question okay? No, but I, Go ahead. But I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really looking to see, you know, if you, if you knew offhand what the breakdown was on the, the your, your, you're making a change in terms of the density. So I wanted to know, you know, for the number of units, what, what that bro broke down to in terms of the average unit per square foot. I, I understand that there's, there's variance in terms of, you know, 600 or 900 square feet, you know, for any given unit. But I was actually more curious in terms of your overall offering, how that changed the numbers. I know, we know how they change from one and two bedroom, but I, I don't know from a square footage basis how that. I'd happens. have to go back into plans, and if we want, Mike, we could get that to you, but I don't know that off the top of my head okay. to answer that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Any other questions while we have Mr. Maybe up here? Thank you, Mark. Well, if you would keep yourself available, we may um, have some questions for you as we get into our deliberations. Okay. okay, and what we'll do is go ahead and open up the public comment period for this particular item. So Jack, this would be the time for you to come back to the podium, <laughs> um, not, not to preempt anyone else who's there, but... Um, and Commissioner Coots, after, after uh, Jack speaks, I have a few speaker cards. So I'll read through those and then we can open up to anyone else. Start with Thank Go you, ahead. Mike. Now, is one of those speaker cards one that I submitted? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for listening to me. I live on the Racket Club in Macintosh. Um, I moved here knowing the development was happening. And my concern is with the changes presented uh, for a few reasons, points I want to bring up. One, as we um, heard Mike talk about, you know, back when they originally pr uh, approved this, there were some things that they may, yeah. yeah. Back when they uh, originally approved this, there, there were some things as Mike just said that today they maybe would not approve. And in combination with the idea of does this, does this, does these additional units materially or tangibly uh, in, make an impact? And I would like to point out that um, if it makes an impact at all, it's relevant and, and I feel like it's, it's, it's not just does it make a big impact. If there's already a, a big impact that's being made that potentially approved some, some design issues that shouldn't have been approved, then any impact at all needs to be considered a, tangi a tangible impact in my opinion. Um, secondarily, Mike mentioned that, you know, when you make it, we, we made a decision back then that we may not have made today. Well, if you're making a decision today please keep in mind that maybe we, that in the past we've made decisions that we maybe overlooked or rushed. And, and, and specifically I'm referring to this brand new traffic study that isn't publicly available, that's literally been presented for the first time right here. And that was carried out by, we don't know who and what, and what methods. So if, you, if you're planning on making a decision on this today, please consider that new, new discussion of a study of a traffic study hasn't been viewed by us public. And, and if it hasn't been viewed by you and we haven't had an option to like go through it and address concerns, maybe today's not the day to make a decision um, because I think traffic is one of the material issues at hand. And if a new studies come out to quell our concerns, we need time to read that and, and think about it. And then um, thirdly, I'd like to just mention that, um, you know, 1.8 park, 1.75 spots per unit parking. I like the increase. I don't think it's enough. I think that leaves us with 30 cars that don't have a parking spot that is just residents. 
cars. Because if everyone has two cars, like Mark just said, there's 30 cars now that don't have a place to park. Where will they park? And I think um, lastly, the, the, the intersection on Canyon Center and Racket Club, that, that's uh, north end of Racket Club is essentially gonna become Canyon Center Drive. Like that's no longer gonna be Racket Club Drive. And <clears throat> it's just the exit to Canyon Center to Fort Union. And what's gonna happen with all those cars, and I feel bad for all the people who are gonna be having to drive there because it's gonna be horrible, but they're all gonna choose to go up Racket Club and down Winesap. And I think as a community, we need to be protected, not only in parking for those 30 cars and all their guests, but in the traffic that's coming out of Canyon Center that says, I can't go down Racket Club Drive and go right or left on Fort Union. Um, I need to go left down Winesap. As a community, we need to be protected for that traffic. And if, if you can grant us like some type, if there's some formality where we can say, we can block that off or we can make it one way and make that part of your notes to say, we are entitled to protect that street from for our neighborhood traffic and not make it a boulevard for Canyon Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Commissioner Coots, the first card I have is Jeff Chatelain. Chatelain. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jeff Chatelain. I live on Racket Club Circle. Um, as Jack mentioned, Racket Club Drive is about to become a nightmare. So the traffic study, I have a problem with a few statements seven years ago, traffic patterns. I walk my dog every day down that sidewalk and stand there, uh, Canyon Center Parkway, which we don't know that's the street because there's no signs. McCandless says maybe that's coming. Why didn't the city require street signage? There's no signs. So nobody knows where that street is. There's not a sign today. I stand on that corner and watch cut through traffic of Fort Union. They cut up Racket Club. They go through Canyon Center Parkway and cut through because they don't want to go to 7-Eleven. They don't want to go to Wasatch Boulevard. It's dangerous. So Jack is right. All the traffic and that exit and entrance to this new apartment building is right next to the crosswalk. It's 30 feet, I believe, or 40. The fire hydrants there the entrance and exit couldn't be placed worse. So back to the reason we're here, number of units, we have too many units. Let's take 81,000 square feet of office space coming. The Canyon Racket Club condos, they were already there. Weekly, these apartments, Sayola, you got Kevin Gates coming back in as a proprietor, right? He's taken the permit out and owns the property. He's the original owner that sold it to McCandless. That's another story. However, the Marriott's never operated at full capacity ever. They opened in April. There's never been a ski season. I've got numerous photos, racket cup drive. When it snows, you don't wanna be on that street. They double park, the plows can't get there. We have a safety concern. And now we're asking for more units. And I've never heard, Mr. Maybe, what's the amount of rent? Because I believe this is about money. This isn't about units and the well being and safety of our community. It's not. So, you've never said, or have I heard or missed it? What are the rents? How are we, how are we justifying more people? Parking's great. McCandless said it'd be free. I've never seen more than two cars underneath the Marriott, ever. Never. Nobody parks there. You got Porcupine and Alpha, it's a traffic jam daily. And now we have entrance and exits right next to their establishment. It's a poorly designed plan. And so these old traffic studies, these old traffic patterns, come stand out there with me tomorrow and watch who cuts through, no stop signs, one stop sign, they run through it, crosswalk, you're dangerous. This isn't a place to raise your kids anymore. Apple Valley subdivision, where Jack lives, where we all live, we're in danger. And if you're gonna give us all permits for no parking, we're all signing up tonight. So can we hear what the rents are though? Because I wanna hear the greed. There's greed going on here. So Mr. Maybe, do you know what the rents are? Hold on, hold on. that's not part of this procedure. You comment to the commission, the commission can ask questions of the applicant. Jeff, you have three minutes to speak to us, but, but um, it, it's your turn to share. We don't have to answer and please, yeah, please don't direct anything to anyone who's in the audience. Okay, Commissioner Coots, the next comment card is John Kennington. 
Thank you. And John, that, that comment goes for every, every speaker. Let's be civil. Um, we're all neighbors. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Kennington. <clears throat> I live in Apple Valley, about two blocks west of the proposed project changes. Um, anyway, uh, the traffic studies are acknowledged, but this is um, a resident's um, perspective and opinions, okay? Although I don't di live directly adjacent to the proposed project, I still will be affected by it most directly by the parking and traffic situations, which are already problems. On winter weekends, especially folks are parking their private vehicles on our street. This is to the west of the project, okay. <clears throat> uh, to rendezvous with other private vehicles or make the long hike to the bus stop at the Big Cottonwood Park and Ride. It's often difficult to enter Fort Union Boulevard from our street as the traffic waiting to go up Big Cottonwood is often backed up a quarter to a half mile beyond it on Fort Union to the west. Many residents in the areas west of the Canyon Center development are concerned about the parking problems spilling over into their neighborhoods like the previous speakers have mentioned. In addition to 28 more units and possibly up to 50 more cars utilizing this area will make the problems worse. Although the project will have its own underground parking with apparently no public parking spaces, tenants on the Southwest side of the project will likely utilize the more convenient street side parking on Racket Club Drive, thus further exacerbating the parking problem for the employees of the nearby businesses who already, already fully utilize this curbside space. So where are these people going to park? The development of the Canyon Center property has made traffic congestion and parking problems in the whole Big Cottonwood Wasatch Boulevard area worse. And many of the already approved projects have not been built or not fully uh, functioning yet. The Southeast office building and this project are not even built yet. The Sayola restaurant, the Seven Settlers distillery are not operating at full capacity yet and probably the residents in as well. So there are plenty more automobiles that will be added to the mix already. If cars are parked on both sides of Canyon Center Parkway, it essentially becomes a single lane road. Before anything more is added, there should be ample free public parking available and facilities to accommodate accessible and inexpensive mass transit should be developed in the Canyon Center. This all affects what's going on concurrently with the Highway 210 EIS process all the way up to Alta. It's my firm belief that that changing the public's behavior toward use of convenient and inexpensive public transit is the key to solving the parking and traffic problems in this area and the two Cottonwood Canyons. So in summary, I am firmly opposed to allowing the proposed expansion of the project in order to reduce the coming increase in the intensity of these already existing problems. Thank you very much for allowing me to comment on this most important issue. Thank you, John. Next speaker, excuse me, next speaker card is Jim Rock. Good evening, I'm Jim Rock. Uh, I'm here representing the uh, Canyon Racket Club uh, Homeowner Association. I think if you represent an association, you get five minutes, is that correct? Yes, you agree? that's right. That's right. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, we're, you know, we've been consistently opposed to any expansions over the original plan, unlike others who have just, you know, opposed everything. We understand that this is going to happen. We see the deck stacked against us. We've been trying to make this work as best as we can. Uh, we've been very disappointed in the decisions, but we still try to offer constructive comments. 
you know, the, uh, the code says that you can have 14.5 units per acre. And if, and, you know, unfortunately the way it's calculated here, that takes up the, it takes into account the whole 10 acres. Actually on this 2.5 acre tract, it's a 50, it's 56 units per acre that's there. So that exceeds the 14.5. However, as we found out going through this process and it really became clear yesterday, uh, what has been approved for this site would actually allow 154 units per acre because you can have up to 385 units, which is ridiculous, but it's what the city approved, what y'all have approved. It's a problem and we're just thankful that uh, you know, it's not any more than that. We know this is going to go through. Uh, I had a very good discussion last night with the developer here and a surreal comment that I didn't think I would make. We think we can make more progress with the developer than we can with the planning commission and the city staff. We think he's more open. We think that's a sad situation, but it's something that, that you know, that we, uh, that that's the case. Um, we have the, you know, Will these 28 units make a difference? Well, it's made a difference in the city staff recommendation. They have fought us about a left-hand turn on Wasatch Boulevard. This 28 units has tipped them over to where now they're recommending no left-hand turn. So it's made a difference. It's made a significant difference. Uh, there, there, there's just, uh, but what we wanna do when this goes, we know it's gonna be approved. Uh, we wanna work with the developer to try to mitigate whatever we can, but we would like to be listened to in the project. We've come up with solutions that are now being adopted by staff, which have been opposed before this. We proposed no left-hand turn on Wasatch Boulevard. That was opposed. We talked about, because of the decision of the planning commission for David Weekly Homes to have a very poor development with no interior trash and inadequate parking, we proposed that there be parking dedicated for the David Weekly Homes on Canyon Racket Drive. That's been adopted. We worked on restriping. We wish we would have been consulted. If you go and look at it, the, on, on the west side of Canyon Racket Club Drive, the drive lane is nine feet wide. The parking lane is 11 feet wide. There are three fire hydrants. There are three legal parking spaces in front of those hydrants. We would like to work going forward with some solutions. We think maybe we have to consider, except for what's needed in front of David Weekly Homes, no parking at all on Canyon Racket Club Drive. It may be because when, when you take the, the left-hand turn off Canyon Racket Club Drive into Canyon Center Parkway, immediately you have to make a right-hand turn into the apartment buildings. We think that because of the pressure, particularly now that there's gonna be no left turn, which looks like will be the case, more pressure on Kenny Racket Club Drive or his Fort Union, we think maybe we should consider no parking on that part of Kenny Racket Club Drive. That is gonna become the major in ingress egress to that to there. We would like to work on solutions, but we wanna be considered. We don't wanna wake up one day, find something that, you know, like we have found with the striping of the roads. And, you know, we do wanna work uh, constructively, we think we've offered uh, solutions that have, that, have, that have been adopted. So uh, again, we, we oppose the increase. We know it's gonna be approved. Just help us help you. The solutions that are coming up with are solutions we've proposed. We live there. We know what happens with the traffic flow. Please listen to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for being engaged. Next comment card is Ellen Morrell. Hello to everyone on the Planning Commission. Thank you for letting me take a moment with you. I live along Wasatch Boulevard. As you may know, I've been very engaged and concerned about uh, transit and traffic uh, related to Wasatch Boulevard, perhaps we should say the lack of transit. Our community in Cottonwood Heights has had a lack of appropriate transit. And as we grow, my comments are going to be predominantly related tonight to the uh, traffic and transit, uh, which our city needs to really, in my opinion, uh, pay much more attention to. 
Uh, currently, uh, the uh, Utah Department of Transportation and the city of Cottonwood Heights puts high, high, high value on an organization called AASHTO, the American Society of Highway Transportation Officials. This is where the level of service comes from. Level of service does not measure the danger and the urban blight that these kind of road conditions uh, bring to our residential areas. And so I would like to emphasize tonight that there needs to be a major shift. Um, NACTO, which is the National Association of Transportation Officials, uh, is much more sensitive to residential areas by its very name, city transportation officials. And I would like to go on record that this problem that the neighborhood is having uh, uh, here near in the Canyon Center area is a problem that is going to continue to plague Cottonwood Heights if we continue to embrace what uh, UDOT wants to lead us uh, down the path with, which is the a highway type of looking at things. Is it only for the convenience of motorists that we plan our community? Or are we planning our community for human beings, for the mobility of human beings? Um, we do not want to go back and correct afterwards. Uh, this is a really a concern uh, uh, to me and to many residents, uh, this attitude that will uh, go ahead and pass uh, these various expansions uh, within our community uh, and then correct things afterwards. Uh, as many uh, speakers tonight have already brought up, we have not experienced the Marriott at 100% capacity, which will come with the peak ski season. We have not addressed uh, the ski season and what happens when these roads are blanketed with the snow that we know will come. When the office buildings are occupied, uh, you know, there's a big difference to say that there's only an 18% difference between what happens now and in January and February when we have, again, a maximum interest in our area for uh, vacation or skiers that are coming into uh, our area. And so I think uh, this is a really cautionary tale what's happening tonight. Uh, we have a chance to, to really embrace our community and the dynamics that we have and ha the big difference between winter and the fall season. And it's, much, it's gonna be much greater than an 18% difference. Thank you for letting me make these comments tonight. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Ellen. Commissioner Coots, I don't have any more speaker cards, so we'll we'll turn it over to people in the audience. Just just come up one at a time and state your name. Thank you, Mike. Go ahead, it's okay. My name is Woody Knoxon. I live in Racket Club Circle. Two quick points before I get to the, the two charts I gave you. One, when you look at the renderings of what's being proposed on the new uh, apartment building and look closely at it, you realize that the height of the building is 12 to 14% higher than what was approved. I think that needs to be reviewed from the standpoint of the impact of the residents and does that do them undue harm to the people who live very close to it. There's a change of eight feet that was agreed to back in 2016. Number two, back at that time, there were two levels of parking proposed. One level, and I have the prints here if you'd like to look at them, dated 2014. <clears throat> the first level was for the residents of the condo, I mean the apartment building. And the second level was for public parking. And the whole purpose of that was for public parking to reduce the pressure on Racket Club Drive and the whole area of Alpha Coffee, Porcupine, that whole business. That got removed and met with the city manager back in 2016, 2019, excuse me, about getting that re-going and what we could do as a city to get that in place because that would really reduce the situation. But if you look at the graph, the two charts that I just gave you, uh, the handout, the first one shows the page shows the building and the red arrows are all the ins and outs relative to the apartment building. The second page, more importantly, shows the ins and outs of every establishment in the Canyon Center, all the turns that have to be made. But at the bottom of that chart, there's a large circle. And that circle incorporates Alpha Coffee, Porcupine, 
the intersection of Fort Union and, and uh, Racquet Club Drive, 7-Eleven, which is by, by reputation one of the most uh, used or 7-Elevens in the world based upon use per square foot. That whole area, instead of using data that's been proposed to be used in average businesses, all of those businesses I recommend, uh, recognize are all extremely successful. If you compare their data with the regular data that is for transportation for restaurants, they exceed it. They're great. The restaurants are wonderful. My point is on that chart with that black circle, that portion we should use actual data. What's the exact actual, actual current use of that area now? And then for the additional areas that haven't been fully occupied yet, meaning the Marriott, the office building, then use the data for, for traffic and parking. When you look at that, I think you'll find out that the need, everybody I'm sure here has been talking about the traffic situation, but we need to use actual data that we currently could get. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, I can go through that chart and give more details to it. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. Anyone else who would like to come up and, and speak during this public comment? Yeah, uh, my name is Carl Churchill. Um, we live on Racket Club Drive. We lived there for 20 years. We're also the owners of Alpha Coffee. Um, we're part of the problem here. Um, and hopefully we're worth it. Uh, I know a lot of our neighbors are in here. And um, we, um, you know, we, we recognize and we're actually excited about um, what's happening in this area. Um, people in the neighborhood like to walk to the restaurants, like to enjoy the amenities there. I do have serious concerns about um, this increase. It doesn't sound like it's a lot, but I think the numbers that we're looking at, we keep talking about how many cars per apartment. One of the things we learned when we opened Alpha Coffee, we had enough parking for our customers, but we didn't count on um, eight to 12 parking spots for employees. Um, so our employees park at the park and ride um, and they get there early enough that they beat most of the ski traffic, um, but it, it becomes quite an issue. I'm also concerned about the backup down Racket Club Drive to that intersection um, and the, the potential for accidents coming out of Alpha Coffee, coming out of um, the Porcupine. Um, uh, and this isn't the form for it, but we really, we really do need to look at that intersection. It's hard to where Canyon Center Parkway comes on to Racket Club Drive there. You can't see to the south. I'm concerned with this building being as high as it is and as close at it, as it is to Racket Club Drive and any kind of um, landscaping there. We really have to be careful with that. Um, so I would ask the commission to really think through the comments tonight. I think I, I agree with what everybody said. There's a lot more traffic than what a theoretical traffic study would come up with. Um, you know, if they're using numbers that aren't based on actual traffic and actual traffic during the winter time and with Alpha and um, the Porcupine and Sayola and Seven Settlers and the um, new office building and the Marriott and then the other um, retail space they're putting in between the Marriott and Seven Settlers. I think um, traffic is a really big issue and we need to be concerned about it. Thanks. Thanks, Carl. Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, there's been a lot of talk about traffic, so I don't want to harp on it too much, but I was thinking about the, the level of the service between the two roads, between uh, intersection of Wasatch and Racket Club Drive. And, um, in the wintertime, we do notice a lot of traffic that comes in for the skiing. Um, and I'm wondering if the study that's used for the level of service, if there was a way to calculate during surge time, during an accident situation on Wasatch, what, what types of impacts 
uh, occur based on those incidents, right? Um, and then in the winter time, when you have all that additional traffic for skiing, what's the level of service at that stoplight? Like, as a resident, it feels like it's it's a completely different level of service. So if there's a way to actually bracket that for um, rush hour, ski season, things like that, it'd be kind of interesting to see that. Um, so that's a suggestion request on my end. Um, and then there's there's something we've been noticing ever since the um, the additional parking for the for skiing across the street is we were told by the police that it appears that people park in there in the in the parking lot at night and they'll go around and they'll just circle the neighborhood looking for a crime opportunity so they'll go and check door locks and things like that so i wonder if there's any kind of study to, to measure what kind of impact that's going to have on the additional residents that we have there because there's going to be an increased crime opportunity so have we done anything to research that what what does that do to the impact of of the additional people living there are we going to have more crime of opportunity are, are we going to address what we have already and if there is more crime of opportunity then what are we going to do in the future to mitigate that um, so there's additional public cost involved with that to, to kind of think through i think as well um, and then the because these apartments are one bedroom two bedroom it, I think there's an opportunity for people that people look at it and they're going to say this this could be a vrbo right and i know we have an ordinance in place that says you can't do that but because of the way this is set up its location and the opportunity there's going to be an additional ability or necessity to police that and so who pays for that how are we going to manage that that part of the aspect right um i mean we're talking about 140 units it's gonna happen. It, it's just something we have to kind of think about, right? And just the the cost associated. Um, and then with those additional residents, what's that gonna do to the neighborhood, right? So as they're walking through the neighborhood, um, it's not necessarily gonna have a detrimental impact, but um, there's just gonna be more people in the neighborhood. So how do we manage that through the neighborhood, like public traffic through the, the residential areas? Um, are there going to be additional stop signs? We already have a kind of an issue with speed. So how do we, how do we manage that as well? So anyway, just a couple of bullet points. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, everybody. I'm Meredith Garcia, and I wrote Mike an email not too long ago. I live in the David Weekly homes. And I'm going to just wing this. I didn't really write anything, but I took a few notes when I was sitting here listening to the others. It was mentioned that eight settlers is not up to full speed yet, but if you see it on a Friday or Saturday night, it's taken up all the extra spots on the street. So <laughs> that's something to think about. They're not using that underground parking for visitors. I don't know why, I guess wait until winter, but that's an issue already. Um, this gentleman just mentioned speeding. I have an eight-year-old son and it scares us sometimes, the people who are cutting through, you know, to miss that light. Um, have we thought about speed bumps? Have we thought about, I don't, I mean, and that brings up a whole nother issue. What about emergency services? How, are, how is it going to get to, you know, the apartments or our houses or the other racket club condos if the street is blocked you can't get to any of the fire hydrants it's a problem and then if all those parking spots are full where are the visitors going to park for the apartments they don't even have two spots per unit um and the other gentleman said crime is an issue it's true our little community has had quite a few incidences from our garages. If you leave them open, things are taken. Um, we haven't understood it until now, but he brought up a very good point. Maybe this is happening and it's gonna happen more. So some interesting things to think about. And also when 112 or 140, whatever's passed, when those people are moving into the apartments, where are the movers gonna park? In the middle of the street? <laughs> How are they gonna get their stuff into the apartments? 
I doubt that the entrance to the parking garage underground is going to be tall enough for a large moving vehicle. So some other things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meredith. I can't see the audience. Do we have any other movement out there? <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. Yeah, my name, uh, good evening, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Robert Trausch. I'm a um, resident at the um, David Weekly um, Homes. Um, just lived here for less than a year now. Yeah, moved in from out of state. Um, the concern I have, and I'm not a lawyer understanding um, how the state law of Utah goes, but I guess the question again, what is a significant increase? Uh, I don't quite understand when, you know, um, uh, the city says they probably made a mistake or at least represented the city and they wouldn't have done, uh, had the kind of parking they did now. And, and so what is a significant increase on top of an already problem? Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to approve this on that. Um, I also noticed from our own development, large pickups just don't fit in garages. And I don't think they fit in underground parking either. And if we look around here, uh, it seems like everyone drives a large pickup. So where do these uh, automobiles go? And again, what's this significant further amount? Um, there just isn't much. I agree with um, Meredith that um, you look at the settlers now, their parking lot is packed on weekends. So I can't imagine now that the Marriott's open and these other establishments are getting up. Um, I've talked to policemen to ask them to explain the parking on the street, and they seem to be clueless. There's no signage that states anything about, there's blue lines. I said, what is a blue line? And the policeman said, I don't know what a blue line means. Um, so there's really not much um, for amelioration. Yeah, uh, and you know, I think people that will rent these are gonna be skiers and they're gonna have friends that are gonna be skiers and they're gonna be coming down from the canyons and stopping there. So it's gonna be a zoo down there uh, in no time. So when you start saying, what's a little more of a zoo? Well, you know, I think, you know, as you start getting the phone calls with the police, you know, and people parking and, and you know, uh, workers can't get in place, it's just gonna, be a fiasco. So I think anything you can do to prevent it, again, I think it's one's definition of what's a significant expansion. I, I think it's significant expansion on an already poorly overwrought uh, area is uh, not going to turn out good. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. Good evening, Monica Anderson. I too live in the David Weekly Homes. And just to put things in perspective, an additional 28 units is more than my entire community. We have 17 units and we are suffering these problems already that have already been said. There's no need for me to repeat them. But that illustrates really the impact of 28 units when you look at what David Weekly Homes, the impact of that community. And the other in uh, interesting issue is that these incremental improve or modifications that have occurred over time, they have a bad result. It is detrimental. That's what happened at David Weekly. Now we have 34 trash bins on the curb every Tuesday night. And it's just very, very frustrating. So I would ask that we have additional time to review the traffic study, to talk with the developer, and to, I would ask that no decision be made. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Hello, Commission. Uh, this is Eric Kran. Um, just one quick observation. Um, we've been talking a lot about cars and community and community is not formed by cars, it's made by people. And um, the condition that was made for this project for the densities determined as an overall 
And I think that uh, a lot of what we're talking about over here is about making this place successful for the entire project. And um, if we look at where the park in the center of the entire project, and then there's the open space across the street as it opens into and it enters into the, what I'm calling a donut looking um, for the condominium area. And adding those extra units is basically gonna close that donut and it's gonna cut the project and you know, uh, break a little bit away of what the connectivity and it's not all about cars, it's about people being able to actually enjoy and feel like they're part of the entire area. And uh, we're closing this area up and people are gonna drive in in their cars. And it was just explained that it's gonna have a lot of great facilities inside. So the people that live in there are just gonna live in there and really not even see the outside, uh, the rest of the facility from the inside. It's not gonna be activated, in other words, and it's not gonna be part of the greater area of you know, the restaurants and the hotel and the park. Um, I think that Cottonwood Heights has a lot of open space already, and a lot of this open space is hard to activate. This summer, we actually had bites on Heights that got canceled because nobody was showing up. And um, we need to actually build the environment for people and for how they're going to use it. And if I see any success in this project, it's actually how that little open space area that's left from that opening in the donut, as I call it, towards the park and towards the rest of the project is going to actually allow for the interaction of individuals and work their problems by getting to know each other and maybe you know come up to solutions about the parking and the cars and everything else by actually themselves so working as a community. And if we close that up, then we're gonna have a bunch of strangers living with another bunch of strangers with a whole bunch of cars traveling through. And that's not how you build community. And I think that if we're gonna look at conditions, those uh, conditional you know, permits, um, that's part of what was considered as a whole. And that's why they're actually being offered a certain level of density as a whole let's think about this project and this increased density as part of the whole and how is that going to impact the full usage and the success of the entire project. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. A little out of breath, I scrambled to get here, but uh... My name is Michael Romney and I'm uh, a resident of the Canyon Racquet Club condominiums and uh, we're also a commercial developer and so got some insight into uh, the issues involved with um, this type of development and, and complications. Um, I've lived in the Canyon Racquet Club condominiums for uh, years and so I've personally been able to see the impact that um, even the minimal uh, usage of the current phase of the development with the Marriott and the restaurants, how significant that is. Um, one of the prior speakers said, uh, mentioned that the David Weekly Homes is 17 units. Um, this entire next uh, apartment development is the jump from 112 to one, uh, I'm not sure if the exact number 140, um, is, is not insignificant. Um, and also, I know we're trying to limit the scope to the significant impact of the additional units. Um, and like uh, the very first speaker said, uh, all right, I believe his name was, is that any, if there's a flaw in the larger project and it's already impacting, uh, putting undue burden on the people, then any additional impact is significant. Um, I, I haven't, had time to uh, look at the traffic study in detail because it's not available. Um, but the average daily traffic, I believe, jumped from uh, 500 and something to 640 something. Anyways, I did the math and it was uh, a 23 point something, 23.7 percent, 24 percent difference. So nearly a quarter additional. Um, is not an insignificant amount of additional burden on top of the uh, already undue burden that is 
uh, being placed as it is uh, and the prospect of, of adding incremental burdens on top of something that's already undue just because that last 25% may only be 4% of the bigger, all the phases combined. If we were to follow that logic, we could incrementally increase into perpetuity because any given increment could be justified uh, in context of the larger whole. Um, and I'll be quick, I got 20 seconds. Um, the crime uh, aspect was a, a new thought, not new, my, my truck got broken into last week, uh, two weeks ago, getting uh, parked on Canyon Racket Club Drive. And it looks like we had an additional break in just this last week, judging by the broken glass. So that's a consideration to take as well. And I would encourage us not to make a decision today. Thank you, Mike. Hi, my name is Chris Dowling, and I'm uh, a neighbor to Jim Rock and Mike Romney over at Canyon Racket Club. Uh, Jim mentioned that we we already know this is going to be approved. I, I don't know, maybe he knows something I don't, but I, I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm, if this is a fait accompli, what, why are we here? Um, I'm just hoping that the commission will kind of weigh all these issues before a decision is made. The density of traffic over there is already extreme. And to add 118, 112 more units is going to make it even more so. And Mike mentioned that uh, <clears throat> there was a little bit of conflicting information. I, I heard 11 more trips, and then I heard that extra 28 isn't going to have any significant impact. It's counterintuitive, counter, counterintuitive to me that 28 more units isn't going to have some kind of impact. 112 units going to have a great deal of impact. So I, I think we have an opportunity to lessen the impact of this by sticking with the 112 units. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Ariella Gottlieb, president of the HOA at um, Canyon Center Court. I have a quick question. Wasn't there a master HOA approved in which, is it Michael? Mark, sorry. And myself and the McCandless and so on and so forth of the five different parts or phases would have a master association. I was reached out to by McCandless and there were forums. Does that sound familiar to you? when you speak about like Ariel, if you if you would approach the mic and just address specifically for the commission your comments on on this conditional use that would be great because i thought there was an approval for a master hoa there there through the city's process there was a master plan that was approved for the for this entire site and i that that so for the city process that then what happened is now they have sold as you know um, parcels have been sold and developers are developing these individual parcels. As far as any kind of agreement amongst the owners, that would be a private agreement and that wouldn't have any bearing on our process. Okay. Just so I'm clear though, in the project scope, I understand that there was a delegation of each owner having a seat on a master HOA to represent the community as a whole. Are you that would be a private agreement again. We wouldn't know anything about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa. I live on Macintosh Lane. And I, you have heard all of the arguments that everybody has for traffic and safety and all of that. And I just want you all to think and just consider yourself in the position of living in our neighborhood, in our community. And just like think into your heart. And if you were there, how would you feel about all of these concerns? Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Lisa. Jill, do we have any online comments? Any hands raised? Commissioner Coots, I'm not seeing any other uh, people interested in commenting. Okay, thank you, Mike. All right, we'll um, go ahead and move into uh, commissioner's discussion and deliberation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave this public comment period open until we get there and see how we decide to move forward. Um, if we decide to take a vote this evening, then what we'll do is close that. Um, if we don't, then I think it would probably be appropriate to leave that open. And I throw that out to all of you to see if you agree um, with that opinion. Um, Commissioner Coots, I'm sorry, there, there is a question and answer dialogue box and I am seeing two open questions. Um, and that from um, one, one- So, so we don't, we don't, utilize that for public meetings because they're it's hard to view publicly so anyone in there um can can raise their hand within the the zoom and speak or can contact staff uh offline and we're happy to answer any questions i and mike you know i i saw those two actually and and it felt like you know more other than they're not really commenting they are questioning though and i thought i think we can bring those up in our deliberations maybe Sure. Um, with the planning commissioners here. And then of course you have those now as part of your record. So if you um, as city staff can respond, that would be great. But we'll, we'll include that in our discussion, I think as well, just to make sure that people are as engaged as they can be. So back to um, commissioners, we'll open this up for discussion and, and just following up on that, I'll, I'll go ahead and read those two. They're very short questions. Um, and then we, we can include those in our discussion as we choose. Um, one of the questions asks, where will guests visiting people, guests visiting people who live in the dwelling units park? Um, and I think we have that just in our ability, to, you know, the numbers of parking stalls, we, they're either available or they're not in, inside the, the apartments. Um, the other question was, does the city have plans to mitigate additional traffic added to nearby residential streets? Uh, and they include uh, Racket Club, Wine Sap, and Macintosh caused by Canyon Center. That was a big part of the discussion I think we just heard um, from people that have engaged in the process and come here to share it, their thoughts with us. So um, I'm sure that will be a robust part of the discussion. And then, you know, in, in regard to parking for guests outside of their dwelling unit, the parking counts are the parking counts. They have, uh, let's see if I can, I wrote these numbers fully down. I think it was 249 total stalls for 140 units. So with 70% being one bedroom and 30% being two bedroom units that um, they'll park where anyone would park uh, on a public street or, or so it's, yeah, it's impactful. <laughs> All right, commissioners. Um, I, I do have a question. I was wondering, Mike, I know it, uh, you had recited the statistics, uh, but I didn't see them in the documentation. What was the uh, ADT number that you uh, cited in the traf from the traffic study? And Let's see if I have that in here. Created from the uh, from the apartment building. From from the additional. So I think you had. I think you quoted two numbers. One oh, was yeah. the total. ADT and when was the change? One second. So 616 and 762 total daily trips. Yes. So, so thank you, Commissioner Abler. 616 daily trips, um, and that's coming and going and going all directions uh, generated from the 112 units anticipated. And that increases to 762. 762 with the additional 28 units, which is 140 six uh, approximately additional trips. Thanks, Mike. Okay, that's really helpful. I, I uh, you know, Commissioner uh, Ebler mentioned the level of traffic study and I, I did pull up that table and I, I think it is worth uh, verifying uh, that the correct level of uh, permit study was used. Um, 
because of the nature of the concerns of that we're hearing here by the public, uh, because they are surrounding that very issue. Uh, and I, I looked at the requirements between the level one and level two, and it does have to, to uh, take into account additional times of day. It's just a little bit uh, further study. Now, there may be a condition that I don't understand that would keep us in that, uh, that level one threshold, but I, I do think it is worth um, seeking out that you know, a once over because the, the thresholds look to be um, less than 100 uh, additional daily trips. And um, I'm not 100% sure if restricting the left-hand turn um, constitutes proposed modifications to traffic signals or elements of the roadway. That, those are the two items cited as the threshold um, that you have to be under for a level one study. Thanks, Jessica. Um, you know, this one is, um, there were a couple of comments I thought were incredibly well thought out and well said, and, and it came up several times. Um, one is any addition to an already overburdened site is significant. Um, the question that we're being asked as commissioners with a conditional use is, are there things that can, that can mitigate? You know, there were, we started this discussion um, as Mike presented the project, you know, as the city does, they present the application they've, they've received. They've already proposed, um, quite a few mitigation procedures based on what exists today. Um, I'm I, I don't see a way to mitigate any addition um, to this project. It's already, as Mike stated, they received conditional use in 2015 um, and he started the presentation with what, what was approved at that time, at least the architectural renderings. Um, I don't, I, I am not finding a thing that justifies being able to add units at this location or any way to mitigate that. It, it's, it's already based on the discussion, a very urban site in a pretty suburban setting. Um, those are the problems we just heard people talking about. Those are really urban problems that these neighbors are having um, and trying to embrace and engage and solve. And that's really appreciated. I have to say too, personally, I'm really disheartened to hear the level of um, the, those of you that have shared your comments are really, you don't think that we're as a planning commission being thoughtful about this or that, um, that the decision has already been made. I am truly sorry as, as someone who shares this community with you that you feel that way. Um, I certainly don't. And I, I was really disheartened to hear all that tonight, but thank you for sharing it. Those are my can, thoughts. I, can I add to your thoughts? Please I, I do. didn't mean to interrupt you. you no, go ahead. It, it... Um, I'm, I'm concerned too that the simple geographic location of this project, um, I, I'm, I was grateful after the racket club for so many years sat vacant, the developer took the time to try to crack the code on, on making something that would be great in this area. Um, having lived in, in that, the general area uh, starting in 1979, I, I've watched it change and watched it evolve. Um, and watch the difficulties. And I'm grateful for the engagement of our community talking about uh, Wasatch Boulevard and watching nearly 30,000 comments come in. And uh, it's obviously something that we, we as a community are extremely concerned about and hopeful that UDOT will try to mitigate that in some form. But I don't know that it can be completely mitigated, it's simply a volume issue. Um, additionally, uh, Fort Union Boulevard, when I think about the Fort Union Master Plan and the intent of what we've tried to do as a city to try to increase walkability and bikeability and uh, transit. Um, the things I see on that road, I just don't know that there's the size, the space or the capacity to, to, uh, to even handle what we've already got on the books. 
Um, I think it's going to be a squeeze. I, I worry, frankly, about the potential liability for the city based on emergency response. Uh, pedestrians walking to the to the the park in the center, and it, it literally appears like a like a, a donut of a park with people trying to cross over into it. And uh, I'm worried about the the ability for people to um, to ride their bikes, uh, to, to walk safely in that area. And I don't know that there's any way to enforce the, the cut through issue uh, to shave that corner. It's just a, it's a difficult, difficult spot. And um, taken as a separate issue, recognizing that none of us on the planning commission were present when the initial development was approved. Um, I, I share Commissioner Coote's feelings that um, I'm disheartened if you feel like this group does not listen. Uh, because we live in this area and we're affected by it. And so I, I just don't know that, um, you know, any appreciable increase that we can make the argument that we're going to, to not uh, avoid, that we can avoid harm by any appreciable increase, simply based on the current standard, not revisiting any previous decisions, simply saying from where we are right now, any increase will increase harm and increase risk and potentially increase liability to the city. And I don't, I don't know that from my standpoint, I can see a, a good way to, to mitigate that. Thanks, Commissioner Mills. I have a couple comments too, if that's okay. Go ahead, Jonathan, yeah. Sure, um, this, one, this one's really tough. I mean, cause just in general, I really like mixed use and I really like density within mixed use. Um, that being said, I, you know, as someone who wasn't part of the original development cycle on this and negotiations, I, I think this is the wrong mix of uses. And I think the square footage percentages in terms of how it broke out was probably not well thought out in terms of, you know, the, the building site and, and the overall fit to the overall community. And so it becomes tough because you, you sit in a position to say yay or nay, um, you know, especially on something that is fairly incremental if you just look at traffic studies and whatever else. Um, in the work session, I expressed some concerns I had about the, the traffic study just in general. Um, but that being said, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's the real issue with this. One of, one of the things, one of the commenters um, uh, brought out a point on mixed model transportation. I think it's key and critical. If Utah's actually gonna get serious about addressing some of the overall intransient transportation issues, it cannot be car focused. It, it can't be driven by state highway associations, UDOT, et cetera, of just let's move cars as quickly as possible. I get it. You know, traffic is really important for commercial. It's really important for mixed use. But in, at the end of the day, for residential uses, we all have to live here. We all have to like, you know, be able to, you know, get to and from work. We have to get to and from, you know, the, the commercial uh, establishments that are there. You know, we have to get our kids to school. Um, emergency services have to have to be able to you know get through the roads and you know it's one of the other comments was about traffic calming it's fantastic for residential it's terrible for emergency service police and firefighters hate you know speed speed bumps and other traffic calming measures so it's always you know the, the push and pull but um i just have some overall concerns and i really share your comments that it's it's really tough when you talk about we can't fix this because the development already went through it wasn't appealed and that's not what we're considering but what we're considering is whether or not this is appropriate to the overall community. So my, my two cents. Thank you, Commissioner Ebler. Any other discussion, commissioners? I guess I have a question for you all. Um, would having um, either a different level of traffic study or more information on the traffic study help you or do you feel like um, you are ready to make a decision tonight? I don't think a traffic study would change my, my feeling or where my head is headed. I'll, I'll just say that independent of the outcome of this item tonight, I do think that that the city should address the failing intersection. Um, and I, I would request that staff add that item to the budget list or whatever um, mechanism we have to get that on for council consideration. 
Yeah, I'm Commissioner Allen, just to back up that comment. I mean, in preparation for this meeting, one of the things that I looked at was, uh, you know, the, the 2050 um, plan that says if, if Cottonwood Heights never builds again, never, never does another land development entitlement, just what's in the pipeline, just what's there. The, the, inter, or the intersection in the, on Wasatch Boulevard north of uh, uh, Fort Union fails. So it doesn't matter what we do right now, we still have an issue and we still need to actually address it right now. And, but you don't, you don't do that just by building car centric developments, especially in a community such as this. I do need to clarify, we're I, I just from a staff peer analysis perspective and what we are legally allowed to do and not to do. The, the question is a little different than whether this is a good fit or not. It's whether this complies with code and whether there are negative impacts that cannot be mitigated. Mike, I think we're aware of the question. What we'd like to know is if you have um, a, a motion or a suggested motion that you could bring up, that would be really helpful. I, I don't, I apologize. I don't have model motions prepared because I, I hadn't updated the staff report and received the traffic study uh, late today. Okay, well, let me thank you for your input. It's much appreciated. Um, what I'll throw out there to you commissioners is, um, this is this is the request that was put into the city and that is put into the planning commission this evening. Um, receiving public comment and taking possible action on a request from Mark Maybe it does for a conditional use permit to update the Canyon Center multifamily building. So the request is to update the conditional use permit that was approved in 2015 with the additional units as has been clarified throughout the discussion. So that is um, what we have before us today as a decision, should we choose to take it. As has been mentioned several times, we can um, choose not to take that decision, make that decision today. If we want to have a, more information, we think that would help us make a decision um, or if there is a need for any other information to get us there. I personally feel like I'm ready, I'm there. Um, that was why I asked about the traffic study. If you all felt like that would help you, I didn't see anyone say yes. Um, so if with all that said, I would entertain a motion. I would move that we deny the request from Mark Maybe Canyon Center Residential LLC for a conditional use permit to update the Canyon Center multifamily building to be located at 7358 Canyon Center Parkway that was previously approved by the Planning Commission in 2015. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion, commissioners? Um, I'm not uh, exactly sure how to express this because I, I do think that the bigger issue is out there. And I don't think this apartment building or this change to the apartment building is a single solitary issue. Um, and so as much as that updated traffic study may not change, you know, might not solve all these problems or point us to a solution, I don't see the apartment building as the source of the problem. So I, I, I did just, I wanted to make note of that. I think uh, it was kind of asked or addressed, you know, is there a bigger way to address all of these clearly, you know, well thought out, very reasonable concerns by community members in a, in a different venue, in a, in a greater uh, study. I, I don't know what that venue is, but if that is something that is available, if that could be clarified um, on the record of the meeting, I think that would be, would be helpful, um, and I, I and for the record, I take no uh, issue with uh, holding the vote on the motion. Uh, I was just so I apologize if I spoke out of turn on that one. No, that's what you're here for, um, Commissioner Chapel. I, I, I have a tendency to agree with that point. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to point the finger at, you know, the development, but I, the comment that really kind of rang true with me is, you know, at some point, you know, the, yes, taken, you know, with blinders on, does the incremental change matter? Well, if, if the core fundamental uh, project is flawed and, and something has changed in the last six years, well, we, we have to consider that and we have to consider the mitigation points. 
Um, you know, it's we're making the decision on 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 you know the incremental, but uh, you know th there are clearly some some greater issues at stake. And, and you know, but at some level, our hands are tied in, in terms of of the policy and the procedure, and and we have to vote on just the conditional use and and the update for the increase. Right. Any other comments, commissioners? Okay, we have a motion and a second on the table. We'll go ahead and uh, take a vote. Start with Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Mills. Commissioner Mills, yes. Commissioner Ebler. Commissioner Ebler, aye. Commissioner Chapel. No. Commissioner Allen. I uh, I just want to say why I I wasn't on the commission when when this was approved originally, and I don't know all the details, but what I have experienced from my time on the commission is that there's a lot of give and take on what happens in the deliberation of these kinds of complex projects, and during the the whole approval process with the council and with the commission. And I, I have to believe that part of the previous give and take that I was not a part of was based on this 112 units being a being sort of the maximum density that that this that the commission at the time or the council at the time was willing to accept. And so um, I think that that since that maximum density was previously negotiated and agreed upon with the initial approval, I do not think the additional development density should be approved this time. So therefore I vote yes. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. And Commissioner Coots, I vote yes as well. So we have five yeses and one no for a negative. Uh, so there is no approval of the conditional use permit extension that's requested this evening. And with that vote taken, we'll go ahead and close the public comment period on this item. Thank you everyone uh, for your input and attention. We realize it was a it was a hot topic. We haven't had this many people in planning commission um, at least since the pandemic started. That's that's for sure. And it's much appreciated that you came and shared your experiences and your opinions. Okay, um, our next items on our agenda are our consent agenda, and we have several uh, sets of minutes to to look at and approve this evening. Uh, Commissioner, can I just remind those in the audience we're still having a meeting here, so if you wouldn't mind going out side for conversation, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Okay, the first one is for uh, approval of planning commission minutes. This is 4.1.1 on our agenda from July 21st, 2021. Do we have a motion? Or, or if, if you haven't had a chance to read them, that's fine to abstain. So moved, Chair. A motion uh, and a second. I do I need. I guess I do need a second. It's been a while since we've done this one. A, second. And a second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'll abstain. Aye. I was not present at that meeting. Okay. Our next consent agenda item is four point one two, which is our the media planning commission minutes from August fourth, twenty twenty one. A motion for approval. Move to approve. Second. Can I, sorry, oh, there was one um, a typo, if you will, but it, it referenced um, Commissioner Bevan as council member Bevan. And I don't know if that needs to be changed. It should, yep, good catch. Is that a promotion or a demotion? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so do we want to amend that motion to say with, with uh, changes? I'll, yeah. I'll accept the friendly amendment. Great, uh, so moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the last one is uh, 4.1.3, which are the planning commission minutes from our October 6th, 2021. Chair, I move to accept. Okay, and I do have one, actually one correction on those um, two before, before we move forward, which was, uh, and I don't have those in front of me, I apologize, but 
uh, on the uh, discussion item where we went through the general plan and um, Mike was offering the updates for what's happening with the general plan update for through Cottonwood Heights. Every time it's mentioned, it says master plan. And I believe almost every time it's mentioned, it should say general plan. So if the, the minutes could be amended to show that, um, that was my only, my oh, only God. adjustment. Okay, st still have still have the a positive motion. Do we have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, one more motion, commissioners. Motion to adjourn, Chair. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you for your service. That was um, a very important issue, I think, tonight. Good night.